Okay, so uh, the, the, the plan is going to be to recall what binary codes are and introduce some properties if you have never seen them. And uh, we also we are also going to discuss two open problems, well-known problems that I find very interesting. Uh, the first part is, is rather elementary, so I hope uh, everybody can follow. And the, the open problems, that they are also easy to state, but, but potentially they require several cough mugs to be solved. So let, let's uh, start. <laughs> And the uh, binary code. The binary code is one of the simplest objects that you can imagine. So here we have the, F, uh, the vector space F2 today. And the a binary code is just any subset. Uh, so it's a subset of binary strings. So in, in the picture here, we have the F2 today. And the elements of this code, they, they are called code words. They are represented as, as black boxes here in the picture. So that, that's a binary code. As easy as, as it can be, right? Uh, just a collection of binary strings of n fan. And uh, it's very convenient to associate messages with code words. So typically we think that we have a message space on, on n bits of the same size of our code. And then you're going to consider some encoding map that's going to take a message, a, a, an n bit string into a code word in a bijective way. So here in the picture, we, we have our messages and each message gets associated with a code word in our code uh, via this encoding map. And uh, okay, so we, we have this encoding map. And the first property that we can talk about is, is the rate of the code, which is capturing some notion of size of the code. So the rate is defined as this ratio. So we are mapping a message of n bits into uh, some word of n bits. So you are the, the rate is just the ratio. The rate is the ratio of n divided by n, which is a fraction of information symbols. Let's put it in a picture that's going to be even easier to see. So here we have a message, a string on n bits, and we are mapping it to a larger string, potentially to introduce some redundancy in the process, right? So out of the n symbols that we are using, how many are true information symbols? So the rate is going to find this, this notion. And we would like the rate to be as large as possible. We'd like to introduce as little redundancy in our codes as possible. And okay, so if you fix the space of two today, this would be a low rate code. If you contrast it with a, a code that we have, uh, a space that we have more code words, a uh, low rate code and a high rate code. And uh, it, it's very easy to achieve higher, uh, a high rate in isolation, right? Uh, you can just take the encoding map to be the identity. You take M to be equal to N, and then you take the identity map. That, that's good, right? In terms of rate, uh, it's, it's one, it's as large as possible. But as you might expect, it, it, it may be bad, right? Uh, you are going to have two code words that only differ by one, one position. <laughs> we are going to see why you consider this case to be bad. Uh, okay, so achieving high uh, rate in isolation is easy, right? And uh, towards understanding why it's bad to have two code words that are too close, we need to introduce this notion of Hamming distance, which is a discrete notion of distance. So you take two words in the space, and then you're counting the number of the fraction of positions where these two words they differ. So that, that's called the Hamming distance between these two words. And now having this discrete notion of distance, we, we can talk about the distance of the code. So you look at pairs of distinct code words and you take the minimum of them. And that's the distance of the code. That's the second very important parameter of the code. So here we, we, we have in a picture again, so we have our code, we look at all pairs of code words. And you look at the, the, the pair that achieves the minimum gist, the minimum having gist, that, that's the distance of our code, a crucial parameter. And again, we would like to make this distance as large as possible. We're going to see why. And if you're only trying to achieve large distance in isolation, have families of codes of large distance, that's very easy, right? Uh, you can start with one bit and stretch it, co copy the, this, this bit any time so using this, this replication map. But as you would expect, rate suffers, right? Uh, you're out of the end bits that you are using. Only one is, is a true information symbol. So that, that's pretty bad, but it's easy to, to have families of codes of large distance. Uh, the, the distance is as large as possible, but the rate is vanishing. As n goes to infinity, it, it, this is going to zero. It's a vanishing rate, so it's bad. And so far, what we have seen, we have seen that codes is, uh, binary codes, that simple object, just a subset. It has two important properties. The first one is the rate, which is a fraction of information symbols or equivalently is the size, the logarithm of the size of the code divided by n. So it's a notion of normalized size. And, and we have the distance, the minimum distance of the code. And we'd like ideally to make these two parameters as large as possible. And as you might suspect, there is tension. So if you try to pack a lot of code words in this space, the distance might suffer and vice versa, right? Uh, 
So again, it's easier to, to grasp this in, in a picture. So here, if you try to pack fewer cold doors in the space, you might be able to make them spread out and the distance might be larger. Whereas if you try to pack too many cold doors in the same space, two of them might end up being too close. So the, the distance suffers. So that, that, that's uh, the trade-off that we have. And the natural question is, what is the best trade-off between rate and distance? So that, that's a very natural question in coding theory. And the uh, uh, mathematical motivation to study this is a question about the geometry of this space, kind of discrete geometry. And that, that's a mathematical motivation. And in terms of, it also has applications, compelling applications in this case. If you're trying to store binary data in a robust way, you might want to understand the, the trade-off between uh, rate and distance because you want to store with a, a minimum amount of redundancy. And also if you want to communicate via noise channel, you also want to communicate using the least amount of redundancy to achieve a, a certain level of robustness. And what do we mean by optimally here? So in, in order to understand what, what optimally means, we need to talk about an error model. How cold words are going to be uh, changed by, by, the, uh, by the noise channel or in the storage? So we need to introduce an error model. And uh, it's very common to, to think that we are going to have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob. And Alice has a message. She's going to use the, the encoding map to convert it into a cold word. And she's going to send one symbol at a time via this noise channel to Bob. And you can think that the channel is modeled by an adversary that has uh, infinite memory, infinite power, and can, can change symbols arbitrarily. So if the channel sees a, a zero and it thinks that it should be a one, the, the channel can, can change the symbols and, and vice versa. So the, 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 the channel can, can have a lot of power. But if you do not impose any restriction on the channel, the, the, this model trivializes, right? Because uh, the, 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 the channel is too powerful. It can map all the code words to all zero uh, words. And then Bob does not get to see any meaningful information out of this. So we need to impose some restriction to make this adversarial model uh, realistic. And the restriction that they're going to impose is to put a bound. What is the maximum fraction of symbols that will allow the channel to change? Otherwise, the model is meaningless. And uh, you might be asking how large you can make this, this fraction of, of corruptions. And uh, it, it's an easy fact that this is about half of the minimum gists. So if you take two uh, code words, z and z prime, realizing the minimum distance of the code, and, and then you consider corruptions. Let's say that z gets corrupted to some z tilde, and z prime gets corrupted all the way to some z tilde prime. If you allow more than uh, half of the minimum distance, z, z, z tilde might go all the way to the other ball. And then you have no idea wh whether z, z tilde came from, from z or z prime. So you really need to stay with me those balls of radius half of the gist. So that, that, that's the unique decoding radius of the, radius of the code. Okay. Okay. And, and this adversarial error model with, from the 50s, uh, it's also called the Hemming model. Uh, do, do, that, that, that thanks to Hemming that introduced this model. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. So the adversary, I mean, am I, mm -hmm. it's, it's like my, it's like the devil. It's like my worst enemy. It's like, your worst enemy. Okay. Yes. Yes. The only restriction is a fraction of, of symbols that the adversary can, can corrupt. So it's not some probabilistic thing. I mean, we're really looking no. for the worst case. You can also consider a probabilistic one. The, the channel model is a probabilistic one. It's okay. memory is a, it's, it's much weaker model. The, the, this one is the, your worst enemy. The only thing that we're imposing the restriction the fraction of symbols that uh, the adversary can, can corrupt. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so the code that we are starting with is not probabilistic. It's like a fixed object. <laughs> Very good. The, the, the code can be explicit or randomized. It depends. Okay. Typically, in coding theory, you like explicit objects uh, as well. But but it, it's not always that uh, we know how to construct explicit code. And now let's go back to our question. So we asked, what is the best trade-off between the size of the code and, and the minimum distance? And the short answer is that we do not know the answer to this very basic question. So that, that's, uh, I find it very surprising, right? That, that uh, we should not know. But we do know, we do know a few things, right? Uh, we, we can plot here uh, a curve of rate versus distance. And uh, the, the, the best results uh, that we know, they are for random codes. So here, any combination of, of rate and distance below this green curve, we know that there are codes realizing this. But we may not know how to construct those codes explicitly. Okay, and uh, so th th this is a parameter of random codes. I'm not uh, indicating the, the function because it's not very illuminating to see the function. Uh, and we also have impossibility results using linear uh, programming techniques. So we know that combinations of rate and distance above the red curve, they are impossible. We cannot have binary codes there. And you can see that there is a gap between the green curve and the red curve. And that's, uh, that, that's our lack of knowledge. 
And uh, it's more illuminating to see the difference in parameters when you go to very large distance for binary codes. And, and that's distance half minus epsilon. And, and there you can see a no notable gap between random codes and the best uh, upper bound that we have for the rate. And random codes, they can achieve uh, in this distance regime, rate epsilon squared, whereas our best uh, upper bound is, is epsilon squared times log one over epsilon. But th this is in terms of rate. And, and rate, you, you take the log of the size of the code and then you normalize. So it may seem like a small difference, but it's actually a huge uh, difference. So we only know the size of the code up to exponential factors in the, in the, the block length. So that, that, that's uh, the, the state of affairs. And uh, one question, one well-known question called in theory is close the gap. So you have the, the bound for random codes and you have this best super bound. Can, can, can you narrow the, the, this, this big gap between the two? So that, that's the first open question that uh, we're discussing here. And, uh, and it, what is interesting now is that uh, we, the best upper bound was proven using a linear programming. And, and now we have better convex programming techniques. And one question that one might ask is can, can you analyze those techniques theoretically to give a better upper bound? So if, if there is anyone that uh, likes optimization, that, that might be a good question. And if you like algebra, we, we know codes over small alphabets, unfortunately non binary, that beats uh, the random constructions. So th those are algebraic geometry codes. So for alphabets as small as uh, 49, we have codes that beat the random. But for binary, we don't know. So if, if you like algebra and want to explore this question, let, let me know. Uh, and what we know in terms of explicit construction going back, for a long time, we have no idea how to construct near, near, nearly optimal codes. And recently in 2017, Tashma gave a beautiful construction of codes very close to, to the random parameters. So they achieved that this distance half minus epsilon and a rate that was about epsilon squared. And the main technique there was the use of expander graphs. So they, they, they use a generalization of a zigzag, the zigzag construction of expander graphs. You know what, what, what that is, but it's an expander graph uh, construction. It's very combinatorial in, in nature. Okay. And uh, for, for coding theorists, Tashman's construction was extremely nice because coding theorists they, they really like about they really like codes over small alphabets and in this case it's binary as small well, as you could hope for. The code was explicit. That's great. The, the code achieves near optimal parameters. Again, that's great. And one thing was left open was the, the code. Can, can we decode those codes? And uh, more recently, we, we showed that, yes, that our algorithms should decode these Tashman's codes. And if you have never seen the code, uh, the, the test is as follows. So we start with some code word, um, a Z star, and suppose that it gets corrupted by this adversary, all the way to some Z tilde. And uh, assuming the unique decoding ball, and having only Z tilde, you'd like to recover Z star. So that, that's a unique decoding test. That, uh, and, and that it, it's not for free that codes admit uh, efficient decoding. And for Tashmas codes, luckily, yes, we, we can efficiently decode them. OK. Now it, it comes our second question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't have time to motivate it as, as, as well as the other one. And it's essentially asking for an ultimate binary code, a very, very nice binary code. And let's try to parse it. So we are trying to find explicit. Uh, that's a nice property that we want to have. Efficient least decodable now, that we are going beyond unique decoding. And I'm going to talk more about this decoding of these very large ranges and having that rate. And what is the least decoding task? So uh, in the unique decoding, we, we have that Z star. And the amount of corruption that we allowed only uh, will be shown the, within the unique decoding ball. But now let's suppose that you allow way more corruptions, all the way to close the, the minimum distance of the code rather than half of the minimum distance. And now suppose that our ZZT is there, and you'd like to shoe retrieve this R. Uh, we can try to, to, to find, to, to set this problem of trying to find all the code words right, uh, within that very large radius, half minus F. But if you do so, we may find this star, but potentially uh, uh, other code words might be in this ball. And if the number of code words that lies in this ball is, is small, it's polynomial or even constant, depending on, on an epsilon, you might have hope to, to recover this algorithm. Okay? You might have hope that an algorithm can recover this, this short list. So that, that's at least the coding task. You allow way more corruptions, and, but, but uh, you, you also need to consider that you may have a list rather than just a unique one. So that, that's, uh, OK, so that, that, that's uh, one very nice goal. And uh, here. 
And uh, uh, as you mentioned before, so it, there are other error models. So we, we, we talked about the, the, the Hemi model that was this adversarial error model that's very powerful. The adversary is the devil, it can do whatever it wants to, 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 to the code word, uh, only uh, limiting the, the, the fraction of symbols that it can corrupt. But there are weaker models, and one of them is Hemi model, a, a channel model. In channel model, uh, you are going to look at each symbol individually and flip a coin to decide whether you're going to flip that, 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 that bit or not. Independent. It's completely memoryless. The only thing that it sees is one symbol at a time. It, it flips a point to decide whether to flip it or not, and forgets what, what, what he did. So that, that, that's the channel model. It's a much weaker uh, error model. And if somehow you manage to find these codes, you are getting as nice parameter as the, the weaker the parameters that you can get in the channel model in the hemi model. That, that's why it's, it's quite appealing to, to obtain codes of, of, of this form. But uh, okay, let's not. Uh, Delve too much. So I, I think for future steps, uh, uh, it might be wise to attack, attack simpler versions of these problems. So the, 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 these problems they have been open for a while in coding theory. So but, but potentially for some simplified versions, you have to And uh, okay, that, that, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Please let me know if you have questions. So when you talk about this best balance between rate and distance, uh -huh. uh, does it sort of depend on your goal? Like whether you have limited space or? It, 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 it depends a lot. It depends a lot. So it, it, yeah, you it, it need to fix an, an error model there. So, 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 yeah, it depends on your goal. That's very good. I have a question about decoding. When you make a random, like Shannon showed you can achieve capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. How, can you decode quickly? I, I think so. So uh, I, I, for a long time in the, in the channel model, we only had the non-explicit codes. And, and now I think we do have explicit codes and uh, efficient decoding for, for those explicit codes. But it's, so it's like a much more reasonable GOPA, So like say GOPA codes, which I think you refer to indirectly. Uh, go, 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 GOPA codes are the algebraic geometry codes. Yeah, right. Can you yeah. decode those quickly? Do you know? Yes, yes, but it depends. Uh, coding tiers, they, they are very careful about what we mean by quickly. Polynomial time is great, but typically people prefer a linear time or almost linear time. And algebraic geometric codes, sometimes they, 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 are, they, they are polynomial time decodable, but, but it requires some N cube rather than linear or something like this. So sometimes people prefer to use combinatorial constructions for, for the code, but it, it depends. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And this touch mark construction, it takes an arbitrary expander as input or some specific? Very specific. Very specific. He, he constructs a, a very specific expander for this task. Yeah. That, that. I have a question. Hmm? Is this used like in applications? I mean, by like algorithms? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, 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 but it, as you have seen, the, the state of affairs that we do not even know what option binary codes are let alone how to explicitly construct them and, and use them with optimal properties. So all the applications of binary codes, they are using sub optimal codes in some sense. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't mean that all the error models in practice, they, they, they are uh, as bad as the adversary one. Uh, so we, it, it depends a lot on what, what is the model that uh, people are considering applications. Uh, yeah, but if, if you have the adversary or model in mind, then, then we do not even know what, what, what those optimal codes are. That's, uh, Thanks, speaker, again.